Hey everybody, it's the Plant-Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano and I am happy to be with you. Just in case you don't know, you can always sus- subscribe to this audio podcast. Just go wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe and give a five-star rating to the Plant-Based Business Hour. I don't want to delay because today's subject is so important. So you may have seen there was a study coming out of Journal News saying that Gen Z and millennials anticipate that 40% of their meat intake will come from cellular meat. So what exactly are the advancements that we're making in cellular meat? Let's bring on the leaders who are showing us the way. I want to bring on my guest today, Nieves Martinez. Uh, She is the founder of Novel Farms. Thank you for being with me. And Stephanie Michelson, she is also the founder of Gelatech. I can't wait to hear more about that and what that is. Patricia Bubner just won, went through a wonderful race. So exciting to have you here, the founder of Orbillion. And then Benjamina Balog. I hope I'm saying that right. Am I? Oh, I don't have her audio. Sorry. Yep. Uh, Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, She's joining us from London and she is the founder of Higher Stakes. Okay. So I'm going to go across the board because for those who don't know about cultivated meat, maybe they've been seeing a little bit here and there. Um, The New York Times had an interesting article today, not about cultivated meat, but but how the world is shifting and the mindset is opening to novel technologies and the awareness that the food supply system is changing. But exactly how is it changing? So let's find out what exactly you do and how you do it. I'm going to start with Nieves because at Novel Farms, you do scaffolding. What the heck is that and why is it important? (laughs) Yes, uh, we started this company to solve a big problem in the cellular agriculture industry, which is the lack of structure. So, so far, companies have been focused on uh, producing ground meat. And that is because cells, muscle cells need a, a surface to grow on and to create a real muscle tissue, you need scaffolding. So that is the core um, technology of uh, our company. And with that, we're gonna create whole cuts of gourmet cell-based meats. Okay, so you actually work in tandem with somebody, let's say like Benjamina from Higher Stakes, so mm-hmm. that her cell lines have structure just like a building needs structure and um, two by fours and this kind of thing, you're giving structure so that the meat can grow into these whole cuts. You're also, I think, uh, introducing marbling to the Mm -hmm. meat. Tell me what that's all about. Yeah, so our scaffold, uh, can we can direct the cells to different areas of the scaffold and that way we can direct fat cells to grow to a certain region and then muscles to another. And that is thanks to the high tunability of our scaffolding. Yeah, so mind blowing, folks. If your if your mind isn't blown, just take a minute to think about what we're talking about. Um, and we're going to get into all the benefits of why one would want to do that in just a second. But I, I do want to go around, um, Stephanie. So when I think of cultivated meat, maybe let's say I'm reading about it in Forbes and I think, okay, some people call it lab meat and you're going to be growing a whole piece of meat. I don't think about all the different parts of meat that come with it and and maybe growing a whole piece in and of itself isn't possible. You grow collagen and gelatin. Tell me about that and why we need those pieces in our meat. Um, Yeah. So I think, you know, we're not only focusing on the cell-based meat, uh, but actually I think, you know, if you think about kind of the future of agriculture food and just like you know all the all the everything that we get from the animal kingdom and kind of animal agriculture right like we know that there's going to be this shift and we're no longer be relying on animals hopefully right that is the plan and that's what we're doing that that is the plan so that's what everyone here is doing right and i think you know with like companies like oatly and and just and everything that we found really good alternatives to kind of like meat milk cheeses you know things like that but we also got to think about kind of the the other kind of byproducts we're from the meat industry so things like collagen and gelatin which people may not realize are in products all around them right so like if you're taking uh, vitamins every day they're probably encapsulated with gelatin or you know if you're eating gummies or you're using some skincare creams or even like in the clarification of wine and beers uh, you know we use collagen and gelatin and so in order to really be able to make this kind of full transition away from animal agriculture and any kind of animal uh, derived you know ingredient or like protein or product anything like that uh, that's what we want to help. So we have to think about all the kind of smaller components that go go into it. So that's basically uh, the inspiration behind Gelatech is you know to be able to support that. Uh, it's also huge. It's a huge opportunity for us. Um, and so that's basically why we're using animal cells to make uh, animal free collagen and, and gelatin. 
Yeah, so we're going to get into in just a second. What animal cells exactly are we talking about and how humane or not humane is it? We're going to get into that in a second. But I just want to riff off of that because I don't think people realize how many things have gelatin. Can you imagine explaining to your seven-year-old, the candy I'm giving you has ground up animal joints. Maybe you should tell us what, what gelatin is and what collagen is. Yeah, uh, so collagen is it's actually the most abundant protein in most animals. Uh, so in our bodies, it's about 35%. So it's a very, very, you know, important protein. It's also like Nevis was talking about, like the structural component that mm -hmm. kind of sticks our cells together and it helps create, you know, tissue and organs, things like that. Um, and, and gelatin is really, it's a derivative of collagen. Um, and so, yeah, if you're eating a gummy bear, it's very, very likely that it has gelatin in it, which you then actually extract from like, animal bones and tendons and like hooves and things like that like if you imagine all the inedible parts of an animal right so you have a, a farm with cows you ship them off to slaughterhouse and then all the inedible pieces you don't want to eat like hooves and bones that gets shipped off to a gelatin or collagen plant which then goes through this kind of extensive process with heating and acids and then eventually you'll you, you know you'll end up with with collagen and gelatin so that's that's what goes into your gummy bears and in in yeah. Other things that we don't really think about, right? Um, but the, I also don't blame people, but the, you know, we're here to change that. Right, right. That's what goes into your kids' candy. Okay, so uh, moving on, Patricia Bubner, you have Orbillion. It's so very exciting. You're bringing these unique pieces of meat, let's say things like bison, potentially to the market in the very near future. What I think is so interesting about this is a conversation we'll get into later in the in the podcast about lowering the price of meat where usually something like bison was a very rare piece of meat not everyone could have. Now we're democratizing meat. So tell everyone what you do at Orbillion and how the heck you do it. <laughs> sure, I won't go into all the details, but first of all, Elizabeth, thank you so much for having me and everyone mm -hmm. else. I just wanna give you a shout out because everyone, or you often hear we don't find enough female experts. Well, look at you, Elizabeth, you're a hero, you found us. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Must have been really hard. Um, so, you know, what we do at our billion really, and I love that you say democratizing meat because that's what it is, right? I think we need to look at how will nutrition look like in 20 years from now? How will the population look like? How will the planet look like? Climate change is an urgent problem. You, you can't, I mean, how can you sit there and not do anything about it, right? Beef is one of the major culprits that in food, if we talk about food, that really uh, adds on to, to this problem. So we want to remove beef. We start with bison, we start with Wagyu beef, with um, exclusive, with premium meats, but with the goal of driving the cost down relentlessly and making it accessible to everyone. Yeah, it's such a beautiful thing. How we feed people is going to look very different in the future because of the work exactly. that you're all doing. And as these prices come down, and we'll talk about that, I've even heard rumors like, oh, it's going to be five years. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. But um, it, you are making a completely new world of healthier people, potentially. I want, I want to hear from Benjamina, who's joining us from London. Benjamina, when I go to the website of Higher Stakes, I see bacon. Is that what you're fake, focused on? <laughs> Yeah, so we're focused on pork as a first meat, but we're focused on both bacon and pork belly. So bacon is more aimed at Europe and the US, and then pork belly is more aimed at Asia. Um, and one of the reasons, it, you know, you just mentioned health. One of the reasons that we really decided to go with pork is because of the issue with antibiotic resistance. And mm. it's quite astonishing the amount of antibiotics that are used, um, particularly in um, in pigs, there's as many medically important antibiotics used on pigs in the US than on humans. Um, so it's really, really a big problem. And so creating a, um, a product that doesn't use those is, is extremely important. Yeah. So um, we're going to get into this later in the conversation, but I just want people to understand what you've said in case they don't know about this. So when pigs live in factory farms, and what I mean by that is that their noses touch their butts, touch their noses, touch their butts. They live on top of each other without lots of air, without sunlight, just festering together. It's funny, we've all been talking about social distancing during something called COVID. And you think, oh gosh, you know, we are 7 billion people on the planet and we have to social distance. There are 77 billion land animals that live in cramped, disgusting fecal situations from nose to snout to butt 
all day long because we have forced them to do this. They're not social distancing. So 91% of the planet is not social distancing. You're not going to outrun a pandemic. And we're, now I'm talking pandemics. That's not even really addressing antibiotics, which is what you were saying, Benjamina. So, you know, if you're going to have um, the living, breathing entities in this kind of condition, you need to give them lots of antibiotics because, of course, they're going to be sick all the time. So that means when we're eating that meat, we're taking in those antibiotics. And what that means is that our body acclimates to the antibiotics. And then when we are sick ourselves and we really need antibiotics to help us, they won't work. It's a big problem. Uh, along the scales of a pandemic, it's that kind of colossal problem. Okay, so there is lots of stuff to talk about. And of course, I, environmental is going to be one of those things. But before we leave that, uh, even though I know, let's explain to people who is your market? Is it vegans or is it meat eaters? Anyone join in? Um, mediators, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so just so that we get this conversation, it's ninety-five percent, Elizabeth. <laughs> of course, of course, absolutely, hundred percent. So, just so we nail this for vegans, because sometimes vegans will say, like, "Oh, that's an awful product." It is not geared towards vegans. It is geared towards people who eat meat who are starting to think, "Gosh, I wonder where my meat comes from." COVID has made a lot of people aware of this, and they're starting to think, like, "Gee, is factory farming really something I want to be involved in?" Because ultimately, if you're buying that meat, you're involved in that system. So people are starting to think about this. However, I would like to, before I move on, answer the question for the vegans who are concerned about where you get your cell lines. How are they taken from the animals? Is it humane? What is that situation? I see Stephanie nodding her head. Go ahead and tell me, how do you get your cells? <laughs> well, uh, I, there's many ways you can go about it, right? But basically, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, like the pigs we're talking about, right? Like they get like the ear clips, for example, what you could do is then that little skin piece that comes out of like the ear clip, you could actually take that as long as you have some viable cells and then bring them into a lab. Uh, and then you could culture those cells, you know, forever actually, if you wanted to, but there's many different ways. Uh, I mean, imagine like, I don't know if anyone has uh, as a human ever had any like a uh, skin issues or anything, or like maybe a mold that was looking weird or something. They may take that little biopsy, take it into a lab, culture those cells. So it kind of works the same way, right? So you can actually go about in a way that doesn't hurt the animal, the animal will still thrive and survive and be happy, right? So um, as long as you have some viable cells, you could virtually culture those forever. Okay. Um, there is a book about this for humans. I'm butchering the name, uh, The uh, Unending Life of Henrietta Lacks or if mm. the, any of this is ringing a bell, but uh, we do this for humans as well. We take cells from people and then we keep those cells in Petri dishes for eons so that we can study these cells and um, work with them. So this doing this is not anything new, but um, maybe Nieves or Patricia, you can answer um, fetal bovine serum. We hear this a lot. What is that? And are you guys using it? Mm -hmm. well, oh, one thing I wanted to add that uh, the, animal we took the biopsy from we're gonna be able to see him grow until he dies <laughs> and he has a name and we're really, uh, i'll show photos so uh, you will see uh, how healthy it looks <laughs> okay so you, you so you're just taking like a a little piece of skin and moving yeah, on. i was yeah. i was there I, I i saw it and and then i hugged the little pea in my arms so so and he was totally fine so i can attest to that there are photos <laughs> okay so so vegans need not worry but still what is fetal bovine syndrome uh, mm -hmm. um serum and does anyone use it anymore or have we already advanced beyond that patricia Sure. So fetal bovine serum, or also called FBS, is something that contains all the necessary growth factors of cells. It is derived from, as the name implies, from little um, yeah, cows that are in, still in the belly of their mom. Um, so that's something that has been used in cell culture, and there are other types of serum as well that have been used. And usually you don't need much of it in a regular lab setting. But with, of course, um, cell therapy, cell culture, biopharma using cells, there was a need to find an alternative, not just for cultivated uh, cell cultured meat, but also for uh, biopharma and others. And then that's something actually that um, some of the first things that will be done on any large scale process. So, of course, it's a necessity for any cultivated meat company to also find a replacement that is um, suitable for a large scale process, especially also not only because of where it comes from. And of course, if you want to make a product like us, it's not acceptable to use FPS, but also because at scale, 
this does not make sense cost wise okay. and also from uh, a standpoint of product um, purity and and you know you want to have ingredients that are controlled that are the same every time and for that very reason this is of course a very important topic and something to to get rid of in the course of what we call media optimization and media is the growth solution that the cells grow in Okay, so uh, the growth solution, all the cells need this. It's one of those sort of upstream market uh, components to growing the cells. So um, is there anyone working on a solution to fetal bovine serum or? Because I, I, I think as you say, everyone, <laughs> everyone, yeah, okay. I think everyone, you know, and, and I like how you say the way I describe it always is like when cells grow in an animal's body or in our body, they get room service where the bloodstream really brings them all the nutrients that they need and it takes everything away, every waste materials. And if we look at the bioreactor, that's what we have, this medium and this nutrient dense solution that surrounds the cells where they take what they need and also secrete, of course, their waste materials into this medium, just to give a visual. I love the room service concept. Like we bring it and we take it away. <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, I would like to add that, uh, yes, Patricia said in the media, there's growth factors, right? That, that aid in the, you know, in the growth of the cells and in the body, those growth factors are embedded within uh, the connective tissue, like the scaffolding, as we say. And, and one, one thing that we are doing with our scaffolding is adding those growth factors to the, the structure mm -hmm. itself mm -hmm. so that we don't have to, uh, you know, purchase uh, FBS or, or growth uh, factors in um, separately. So that mm -hmm. could be one of the solutions, yes. Yeah, it's so wonderful. Um, and how these components are all working together. Um, Benjamina, perhaps you can share with me, do you, or, or Patricia as well, do you have to kill the fetus to get the serum or is it a simple drawing of blood or how does that work? I think so. Um, I'm having, I'm, yeah. Do you know, Patricia? I'm guessing yes. It's usually, as far as I know, taken from uh, cows after they are slaughtered. Yeah. Ah, I see. I see. I didn't realize that cows were slaughtered in that state of um, being pregnant. I'm not an expert on that, so, yeah. you know, but that's yeah, I mean, <laughs> as far as I know how it's, yeah. how it's being In given. any case. I, I haven't mean, worked in that business. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so so I do see sort of that vegan component of like, well, hold on, you know. Okay, so so there's that. So we'll hold on to that little thought. Um, but of course, we're we're making advancements, and this is one of the beautiful things about cultivated meat and also plant based meat for for that matter, and fermented proteins is that meat and dairy have kind of run their course. There's no real great innovation that's going to happen with meat or dairy. They've they've done what they're going to do. One might argue for or against if they were good for us for the last hundred years, but definitely we can make the argument they make no sense for us now as we go from 7.6 billion people on the planet to 9.8 billion people on the planet according to the UN, but you're not getting more land and you're not getting more water. So let's talk about some of the resources that we save when we do things in cultivated meat. Again, I see Stephanie shaking her head. Go ahead. What, what do we save in terms of I land and water? To do that too. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, for us, if, if you think about it, right, like we're actually, so collagen is a protein that, you know, that the cells make, right? So uh, if you just think about, imagine having to grow, let's say one cow. So you want to grow a cow for like uh, three to five years, you, you give it some land, some water, some, some feed, and then you ship it to a slaughterhouse, you slaughter it, you maybe take the, the, the meat that you can eat, and then you get rid of what else, and you ship the, like I mentioned, like the, the bones and the hooves and all that stuff to a gelatin and collagen plant. You go through this heating process, acids, you remove fat, uh, which requires a lot of resources, and eventually you end up with like pure, you know, collagen and, and gelatin. That is really inefficient, right? So, and the only reason we're doing it this way right now is because it's a byproduct of the meat industry. Like if we didn't use the hooves and the bones and whatnot, like that would be waste, right? Um, but what we're doing is like, all right, well, instead of going to that kind of macro scale and, and growing the entire cow and giving it all that land and the water and the feed and waiting like three to five years, why don't we instead just kind of grow the thing that makes the collagen itself? Like, why don't we take these specialized cells that are like the best collagen manufacturing, the best collagen plant out there? Why don't we just take those, culture them, you know, under one roof uh, and then kind of on demand? Like, do we want to make this much? You want to make this little, right? Like do that and then just kind of only extract what we actually need, right? Like there's no need to grow it into an entire cow and, you know, spend years and, and so many resources. That's kind of, 
I think that, I mean, and especially how that translates, you know, I, I don't know yet, but you know, that to me, it just doesn't make sense to do that. I mean, really animals when it comes to food are kind of like a really inefficient uh, delivery system in a way, right? Like we put so much resources into them and then we actually get out way less at the end, right? So mm -hmm. it doesn't really make any sense. That's and such a scientist thing to, that thing that to was, say. I yeah. love it. Sorry, yeah. Benjamin. I, I love it. I, I mean, I we're totally putting more research in it. Why would you do it? <laughs> <laughs> it is actually, I mean, if you break it down, right, like you actually get less out of it than you put into it. But uh, at the same time, I don't blame, you know, it, it's the way it's been done. And, and, you know, these things take time to change. But I mean, that's why all these, you know, ladies here, you know, we're all fighting the same on the same mission, right? Like we're realizing that it is, an, it is inefficient. I'm moving in the right direction. But it's going to take some time because it's hard to break habits and, you know, completely kind of, reinvent these things. Benjamin, I, I think agree, you wanted yeah. to say something. Yeah, no, I, I agree absolutely with all this. And I think on top of that, it's also because we're kind of reinventing things and starting things more from scratch, we have the potential to do things better. So, okay, well, we don't have energy, <laughs> you know, that's been installed there for 10 years, that would be a mess to change. So, okay, well, we want to get our energy from a more sustainable source, because we're starting over again. Again, we don't have packaging, you know, lines that are already in place that are running. And it's always way harder to change something that has been there, than something that was starting from scratch. So not just the process itself, but I think all of the things surrounding it, we, we have a lot that we can do because this is something new and that we're starting from scratch. So I think really when you look at it as a full supply chain will be so much, um, so much better. Yeah, I love what you're saying here because really what you're saying is it's not that you're changing meat. You're really forcing a change of the entire food supply system. Um, if I can riff off of what you are all saying, just to underscore how inefficient it is, according to the World Resources, Institute, we put nine calories into a chicken. That means the feed we give them, et cetera, nine calories, calories into a chicken to get one calorie back. What business person would say, oh, I know I'll give you 90 cents so you can give me back a dime. Nobody would do that. It's much worse for cows. It's like 20 to 40. I've heard 33, 35. Inputs of calorie to get one calorie back. No one says, please let me give you, you know, 35 cents so you can give me back a dime. Just horrible business equations. And then to add fuel to the fire, we have wonderful trees. Trees pull carbon from the air. Ah, we cut down those trees. Why? We grow grains. Grains have fiber. Grains have protein. Do we give these grains to people? No, we give them to animals. Then animals need time and land and water. And then nine months go by. Are they ready? Nope. They need more trees to be cut down, more grains to be grown. Given those grains to people? Nope. We're still not doing that. We're still giving them to cows who need more time and more land and more water. So the level of inefficiency is astronomical in a world that we can not afford because it's not just that we have an increased population from 7.6 to 9.8 billion, but we have less arable land, less farmable land because of climate change. So we We cannot afford to waste resources. And again, as we talk about the entire food supply system changing, you're talking about farming changing. I think you're also going to see, as Benjamina said, packaging change. And I think carbon credits, I'm getting off topic here a little bit, but are going to become a big thing. Um, okay, so we're talking about land, time, water. Uh, Nieves would, or anyone, would feel comfortable commenting about the chemical runoff we won't have and the antibiotics and hormones we won't be using. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. So um, we're going to grow cells and bioreactors in a very uh, sterile environment. So the need for antibiotics is going to be minimal, if not like inexistent, <laughs> because uh, uh, yeah, there's is you know labs are clean and and bioreactors is like um, you know imagine a brewery but cleaner <laughs> even mm. um so so yeah that's going to be gone <laughs> for sure and then all you know the other toxins and things that they put into the feed and yeah so in my like i try our own product And, and, you know, I have like, I just put it in my mouth and I was like, yeah, I know who made this, <laughs> my yes, co-founder. Right. And I know is this most sterile thing I ever ate, eaten. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And, and speaking about this, you know, we'll get to this in a second, you know, is this Franken food, food in a lab, or has this been around for a while in a way for those who take insulin, that insulin comes from, I believe it's pig bladders. I don't know if it's bladders per se, but I know it's from pigs. 
And they used to take that from pigs and farms, but of course it was too uncleanly to really do anything with. So all of that insulin they do in a lab and then people give themselves insulin shots. So this isn't- and it's the same with rennet too, for example. So we have a lot of examples out there. You're right, Elizabeth, totally. Yeah, and people don't realize that. So rennet is something that's in cheese. So we used to come from calves, I believe, baby cows, but that was Correct. too inefficient. We're back to baby cows. We're back to baby cows. It was too inefficient. So they took that out and started producing that in a lab. So in a way, the cheese you get is already from a lab. This is not that new. So technology in our life isn't something new, and it's not necessarily something bad. Of course, it could be nefarious if you wanted to do that. We're not doing that here. We're looking at changing the food supply system for a healthy and sustainable world. Um, and then, of course, you know, because you don't have factory farms, so 77 billion entities are going to the bathroom. It's an enormous amount of waste that you have to put somewhere that is inevitably going to run into your water supply. You see where it's at these kind of numbers, the equation just no longer works. Um, okay, so maybe we could talk about one of my very, very favorite precious resources because I just had a birthday. I'm 54. So as I think Congrats. about that, I think about time. And of all the resources, I think time is the most important. So I'm wondering if you can give me a sense of time. So for any one of you who wants to jump in, how long does it take you to grow your bacon or your bison or your, your structure or your um, gelatin? in a petri dish compared to the animal itself so i'm happy to jump in here please um, thanks i so i also want to add something to what you mentioned before uh, and that kind of fits in with this i think as humans we always have been extremely good at using our skills our brains to craft better products and this is what i see happening right now we are doing what we're intended to do, using our brains to make better solutions for humans, for animals, for the planet. If we look back at how humans used to hunt and gather, then domesticate animals, and I know some people call this the, the second domestication, I think it's, it's very fitting. That's what we do. We use the cells from animals and just make more of them without all the bad parts about it. And in terms of time, I want to put it in perspective. Any company out there, even the, the most advanced ones um, that have products out there, are pretty early stage compared to what we can do in terms of amounts of meat produced compared to animal agriculture and to farmers. And this is also something that's, I think, important to communicate. We are at the beginning of this. Sure. We need support. We need government support. We need money. We need people and all of that. And more companies like us to come into this space to create the market that we see out there. Because the problems we're working on are hard. Um, and so, you know, for the products that we're crafting, it depends on scale, how much we can do and how fast we can do it. To answer your question really depends on the scale that we're doing it. If we would use a Petri dish or for us, that would be flasks actually, um, then this takes forever, but there are better ways to do it. There are ways we can do it in a bioreactor, scale it up, and then that's how you produce mass. And then you could do what a cow does, the amount of meat in, you know, a week. Okay, so that's amazing. Uh, just to recap what you're saying, Patricia. Patricia. Like, oh, and, and then Nieves, please yeah. go ahead. Like, um, so estimations of once uh, we have the bioreactor running uh, and calculating how long does it take for one cell to duplicate, which is like 27 hours. So if you calculate that and extrapolate, you can get 200 kilos in five days. Yeah. So, so that's like the aim, the goal that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the difficult part is going to be concentrate all that in, in density, in a, in a, you know, steak, like in a, in a fibrous, you know, in, in the texture, but uh, yeah, cells duplicate in like a day. So, which is so amazing. To, so, yeah, you have to think like the bioreactors, like you usually, you don't put like one cell into it and let it duplicate like you put yeah. a certain number already and it depends how many you put and so you have something called the c-train which is what you get into the bioreactor so there's a lot of dependency um, and it depends as well whether your cells are already for example muscle and so you're just growing them as muscle so they'll grow slower but you don't have to turn them into muscle anymore mm -hmm. um versus if they're still you know um embryonic or induced preparedness and stem cells. Okay, and then we would compare that, let's say five days, I'll just take the, the days that Nieva said, you compare that to 
one and a half years, let's say for a cow, and that is putting the cow under unnatural, enormous duress, because that's not the normal time that it takes for a cow to, to grow. Um, but you know, you're talking about pumping that cow with hormones, really pushing the cow and the feed and the, the stress on the body, which then we eat, you know, so there's that linkage directly to our health of taking in all that stress and all those drugs and stuff. Um, so you're comparing like five days potentially to a year and a half for a cow, let's say, and then, you know, still have to slaughter and get that meat out, et cetera, as you guys would have to do, you'd have to get that meat out and package it. So, um, you know, it's uh, 500 days compared to five days, give or take, once you have scale, once you have funding, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's just so exciting. Uh, but of course, no one's gonna buy it if they can't afford it. So I think the price right now of, of cellular meats, eat just as you know, good meat uh, in Singapore was allowed to be sold in a restaurant. And there's also a super, oh my gosh, superfoods in Israel that has been selling their cellular chicken from their lobby, if you will, lobby restaurant of their lab in Israel. So there are a couple of restaurants that are starting to have cellular meat around the globe. Even Kentucky Fried Chicken in Russia says that they're going to have cellular meat on the menu. I just, it's beyond amazing. Um, but what is it going to cost and how long will it take us to get there? So of course, if you're going to have it for $300, no one will do it. So when are we going to get close to the actual price of meat? Nieves. I disagree or, that no, oh, sorry. I disagree no, that nobody will eat it at $300 a pound. <laughs> Not um, enough really. people. Or, yeah, no, not enough people, exactly. The goal is to bring the price down. But also, you know, it's my favorite pet peeve, but what is the true price of meat today? Oh, you know, gosh. if we look at the price that we buy meat and that people to expect to buy meat, that's ridiculous. That's not what it costs to produce. The farmers don't get a fair share and the animals, as you say, are suffering, right? So I think there needs to be a holistic discussion about how our food system should look like and what part alternative proteins, plant-based solutions can take in there, and how can we make all of these cost-efficient? Impossible foods have, and, and also beyond, have done a great job with, you know, starting at a higher margin and slashing the prices down. So I think that's was something that we will see in cell-cultured meat as well. And the Good Food Institute recently brought out a really nice study where they showed how this can be done by 2030. They expect a price, a production price of around $2.8 per pound of, oh of meat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I think you have to also look at it. Is it the price of cultivated meat as a standalone or is it the price of a hybrid? Because you have, you know, various degrees of um, and various amounts and depending on the product, it will be more or less important. So, you know, if you're doing certain meats, it will be very important to have a high percentage of of cultivated meat versus, you know, if you're doing a sausage or a, a nugget, you don't necessarily need that. And the proof is, you know, most of the plant-based alternatives are already pretty good. Um, so, so that will also quite significantly vary the price um, of, of different, um, yeah, of different products. Well, let's talk about that. Do you see a blending of plant-based and cultivated? So plant-based meat alternative, let's say like a nugget with a cultivated fat to, to bring some of that taste. A lot of the taste, it's not for me, but for a lot of people, they really find the taste in the fat. Um, do, do you foresee that kind of situation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the question, there is no question whether the first products will be this way. Um, I think the question is which products will endure in the really long term. Um, so whether on the long term, will it stay a hybrid? Will it always be a hybrid or will it, um, will at some point you will you be looking at a really, you know, 80 plus percent cultivated meat product? Interesting. Then let me ask your perspective. Um, I'll go with Nieves and then Stephanie. Uh, do you foresee that plant-based foods become obsolete? Um, no, I don't think so. And mainly for the fact that, as we said in the beginning, uh, cell-based meat is geared towards meat lovers, right? And plant-based uh, is more like for vegan and vegetarian uh, vegetarians because they, you know, don't enjoy meat and they really love these plant-based uh, alternative protein and products. So I don't see that as a one or the other at all. Mm. I, yeah, you, no, I agree. 
Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> if you had to guess, what do you think it would be in terms of percentages? I think Benjamina said 80% cultivated. Oh, sorry. So just to clarify, I meant like the product itself. So ah. not in terms of the market, but the product itself. Okay. So what you were saying, Benjamina, is 80% cultivated meat and 20% plant-based right. in a That's right. Or something. That's right. um, but as we look to the market, St Stephanie, how do you think it's going to shake out? This is just guesses at this point, but how do you think it's going to shake out and, and who's going to have the lion's share of the market? Is it cultivated or plant based meat? Oh, that's a very tough question. I think, you know, I think that depends on a lot of things. Like, definitely, you know, like, how, I mean, we're so early on, like, you know, like uh, Patricia said, like, we're at the beginning of this, right? So I think it will also be a question of the consumer, you know, what their preferences are. And of course, like, also just technology, how quickly we can do it, right? I think, you know, with cell based, like, it's not, it's no longer a question of if, it's a question of like how fast and how soon, right? Yes. Um, and so what will happen, that's hard to say. And um, I also just, you know, when it comes to plant based, I, I also think that, you know, if you think about things like tempeh and like uh, falafel, like, these are things that we don't consider like, meat analogs, but they're still kind of like a protein source, right? I, I think there could be opportunities for more like new products that we don't even think about. Like, you know, we don't have to have veggies always imitate meat, right? Like they can be stand on their own. I think that's why they will still always be there. Like Neva said, like they're, you know, they're delicious in their own way, right? So, um, and then, you know, hybrids like Benjamin said too, I think that's super exciting as well to get these like very unique kind of flavors or textures or um, fats and things like that and kind of make, just come up with new things right because that's what we can do now actually that we we have this technology right yeah i love that you say that because of course food is nostalgic for all of us and it brings up memories and feelings but i speak sort of with my united states hat on i know we have an international panel here but the same logic could be applied to, to any any country around the world you know innovation is what we do so when people say to me oh you know we we've never done that before we shouldn't do that or that's something too new i just think like are you going to put us at the back of the bus? Come on, the world is changing. That's like saying, oh, no, no, don't use a computer. I really have to have a typewriter. Who mm. would do that? Who would go, go back and use it? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Who would, or a landline. Go ahead, invest in a landline. I, I, I love what you're saying. And I think the same thing, Elizabeth, is true for the thing with frankenfood and natural, right? People are like, yeah. but it's not natural. I'm like, you know, crude oil is natural and measles. Yeah, <laughs> I, like I mean, you know, there's science because we learned how to deal with catastrophic events. So and and the food scarcity and climate change are pretty catastrophic event. It's just so slow that we fail to see it. Yeah, although, you know, um, I split my time between Chicago and Los Angeles and California is gearing up for the worst fire season it's ever had. So, you know, and if you're on the East Coast, you're gearing up for hurricanes and, you know, we don't see it, but then we sort of do. It, it can smack us upside the head. But let's talk about frankenfood because that's a lot in the news of like, oh my gosh, what's this doing to our food supply? And is it is it frankenfood? So how are you, I mean, I know you're so deep in the R&D right now, but are you starting to think about how you're going to communicate to the consumer about what these products actually are in a way that they can process them? Absolutely. For us, that was our number one thought that guided us. Because if you look at what consumer wants, want, right, that's the problem you want to solve because they will only choose cell cultured meat if this is truly the better product. It has a better flavor. If it is something that gives you the satiation you're looking for and what you're looking for into meat. And I'm always, you know, thinking about people who go to fast food restaurants and eat meat where they know that comes from um, factory farming. They know that most of them, most of the people know that there are other things in there to add flavor, to give it a flavor. You know, that's not meat. So by creating products and, and showing the consumer, being very honest about how it is made. Um, that's, I think, how you can communicate the future of food to people. Mm -hmm. And by saying that, you know, I mean, nobody is grossed out or very few people are grossed out by beer and they go to breweries, sit next to the steel tanks and drink their beer and think, oh, that's a beautiful craft beer. That's what your meat will look like. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it's very important even early on to start communicating to make sure that you have a good message out there and um, guide really the consumers to for them to understand what it is that you're doing. 
And for yes. the consumers to understand what goes into the cells, I know we talked about this a little bit. You have your cells coming from an animal. You just kind of take it from their skin. And maybe depending on the type of meat, it does have fetal bovine serum. That's something that people are innovating to, to get rid of. Um, but what helps the cells grow beyond the structure? Is it sugar? Is it straight sugar? It, it yes. is uh, sugar, amino acids, um, and yeah, there's minerals. Like so, the, yeah. mm -hmm. so it's the, ba the basic components of life, basically. So, it, are you in a situation where you could make the meat better than it is today? Because you are adding things, or is it not really considered additive? It's just a feed. Help me understand that. Oh, uh, so uh, okay. Let me <laughs> let me see how um, you know, like. A cow eats grass and, and grass is made of, you know, like whatever the grass is made is in the media. So there's like cellulose, glucose, uh, fiber, protein, et cetera. So all those things, but just in liquid media. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. Okay. I get it. I get it now. Okay. That's wonderful. Okay. Sorry. I took a little detour there. I want to get back to the consumer. Um, are you sensing since you started your companies, I'll start with Stephanie, but then we just go around the, the quote unquote virtual room here. Are you sensing that the zeitgeist is changing? I started this podcast by saying journal news said that for G millennials and Gen Z, they're anticipating that 40% of their meat intake is going to come from cellular meat. Are you finding that people are accepting more and more? I'll start with Stephanie. Um, I think, I mean, I guess that's a little bit hard to answer, right? Because like, I don't, maybe if someone isn't too happy, maybe they want to interact with us. But so far, yeah. all the interactions, the people that reach out to us have been super excited. You know, we've had people that have been vegan, you know, for many years, which I'll be like, oh my God, I can finally have a gummy bear, like with your right. technology, right? So like, I, I, so far, thank goodness, you know, knock on wood, <laughs> we've only gotten like a lot of excitement around it. And um, I think definitely, you know, with so many exciting companies popping up and just like, you know, educating people a bit more around what it is is kind of like Patricia went on about like, you know, like actually letting them know what it is and making sure they understand it. And then, you know, I'm not here to convince anyone to do what I do or what I believe in. I just want to make sure that people actually have the facts straight and then they can make their own decision. Right. So, and like Neva said, like the things that go into feeding the cells are the same things, you know, that the cells would need in like our bodies or like in a in cow's body and things like that. But yeah, we can actually control a bit more and, and take out some things that maybe we don't want or add some things that we do want. Right. That, that's the beauty of it. And um, that, you know, we're, we're literally kind of designing the entire process, right? So uh, definitely, I mean, we've only had, I mean, I've like mainly, you know, like really exciting feedback and people are just excited to get their hands on it. I think, and even for us right now, every single milligram of collagen we're making is accounted for, right? So we have a lot of co like uh, partners that are interested and we're like, oh my God, we just need to do this, but dude, faster. <laughs> and so I think it's gonna happen. It's just really like how fast can we get? And it's probably the same for, you know, I think everyone here, um, it's just, yeah, let's, let's get, get it moving and let's start scaling. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about that. Um, I guess it's kind of part of the predictions, but um, when will it get moving? I know, and let's take a step back, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Investor interest has been very high. Is that correct? I'll start with Patricia because she just had a nice successful raise. <laughs> Um, yes, I think in general, we see that uh, people realize that this is uh, a really good sector to invest because there's just such a huge market. I mean, we're talking about a trillion dollar market in the future to really open up. And they also understand that there will be many winners in this space because there's not just only one type of meat out there. Right. So I think, you know, we're seeing more and more companies getting more funds that they need to really scale we're still even with with that fantastic raise lately we're still early right mm -hmm. in order to scale you will need to raise a little bit more but we see more and more companies getting that type of money and starting to scale and starting to build the bioprocesses the large-scale bioprocesses that are necessary to truly bring the cost down and bring the product out so with you know more and more products coming onto the market, that's something that we will see in the next within the next two years. So the regulatory gods, you know, will. And um, after that, we you know that will still be at a limited supply. But after that, you know, with more and more companies breaking through that scaling barrier, we will all see also see them becoming wider available in uh, in the supermarket around the corner. But that's still, I would say four years out. And um, then, you know, I personally, I'm super curious to see all the interesting new things that people will come up uh, with and that we will be eating that. 
Wow, four years. So I just had an interview with Seth Goldman, who's the chairman of Beyond Meat. He's also the CEO of Plant Burger, which is an eight restaurant chain, fast food chain. And he was saying five years to see meat on the market. You're saying four. Well, uh, it, didn't Upside Foods announce that they will probably com be commercializing early next year? <laughs> but, yes. you know, that's, uh, that's good. <laughs> that happens soon, right? Yes. I mean, every time I turn around, it's getting faster and faster. Is this because more and more money's pouring in? Is it because regulatory uh, is opening the gates? I wonder if um, anyone wants to take that. I mean, still it's waiting all for the regulatory gates. Yeah. Oh, you're still waiting yeah. for regulatory. Okay. <laughs> and Jimena? Yeah, I think it's all of them together advancing, right? But yeah, there's still some hurdles. And even if you look at plant-based, right, that has been there, I think cultivated meat will scale faster, but even scaling faster, you know, if you look at the percentage of plant-based compared to the whole protein sector, it's still very small. So there is a lot of volume and a lot of work to do. So, you know, we're really, really at the start. And so even when you start seeing the A go to market, but also scale, there's a lot of opportunity for really reaching the huge huge scales um that that we need in this sector so you know yeah yeah totally agree benjamina and i just want to add on what nieves said i mean upside foods have been saying that since years and other companies out there too not blaming them i totally get it but i you know i think we will see a couple of, of products as i mentioned come out in the next year but for true scale it's going to be four or, or five years Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, from the investor standpoint, what are you seeing? They're interested in it because they see a secular trend and an opportunity to make money. They're in it for the environment, for the future of their kids. They're in it for animal welfare. What's the, the driver for your investors, Nieves and Stephanie? I would, the majority of investors I meet, they, they are motivated by the, you know, doing this uh, but entering a space and supporting su sustainability, the majority, right? Because the other type of investors are, you know, it's still too risky for them, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And um, so you, most of the investors I met, they really kind of like come into the space to, to, you know, to be in the future. I would yes. Say. Yeah. Yeah. How exciting. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, same for you. Uh, yeah, I think definitely like, you know, impact investors, that's what mainly who, who we have on board. So definitely like, you know, looking like Nina said, like at the future and making an impact. But of course, I don't think any, you know, investor would, you know, put money into something they didn't believe would, would give a nice oh, yeah, return, yeah. right? So that's definitely, true. but I think, yeah, like impact and, and you know, moving the needle and, and, and towards a more sustainable future, more ethical future and a more efficient future, right? So and that and of course that it is you know like we all talked about it's a huge market and i also just want to add in, in in the previous point around kind of like what's pushing it i think you know now there's you know companies popping up also focusing on enabling like the technologies right so like there's companies only focused on making bioreactors there's companies focusing on making animal free growth factors and scaffolding right and like and collagen and you know in addition to just like the cell-based meat so like there's so many companies now working in the same area that are actually supporting each other and is really helping kind of, um, you know, make it make that move towards, you know, the future, make it viable, actually. And so maybe that is also part of that, that acceleration, right? Yeah, it's wonderful to see that people have that vision for the future and are, are moving towards it really for the betterment of people, the planet and animals. Um, one of the t things that we talked about in the beginning of the show is the democratization of meat. And there are some cuts of meat, like let's say a filet mignon that most people can't afford, but in a cellular agriculture situation, it can be price parity with a burger or what have you. I mean, usually you really bring those costs down. I know that's something Pradish is working on so that you can have these unique cuts of meat for everybody, um, if that's what they want to do. So it's wonderful to see this kind of big investor money flow into the space. But something that's been frustrating for me is where are the government research dollars? The U.S., I feel, is really behind here. I know recently GFI has been talking about uh, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. She's been making a pitch to Tom Vilasek, the Secretary of Agriculture, that we need to start funding alternative protein research. 
but it's shameful. Now, of course, Singapore is moving towards something called 30 by 30. So they are very food dependent, so not independent. And COVID showed us a disruption in job supply and a disruption in food supply. So it's very important for these companies that were really negatively impacted during COVID to get their own independence and cellular meat can do that for them. I also think as we have less land and less water, it's going to be an issue of national security. People are going to start fighting over food and they're going to fight over water. So I'm surprised that the U.S. has been so slow. I know GFI is happy with this like little nod from Congress, but um, I don't know. Do you guys see research funding finally coming your way? Let's go with Benjamin mm -hmm. in London. <laughs> so I guess it's a different government. Yes, um, of course. <laughs> we, we see it more. Um, we definitely see it more and we see as well more just getting invited to the conversation um, and just, you know, getting involved in what can we do for this sector. So there's more and more, but it's also very early, um, you know, and the government, I think, knows that. And yes, they like they want to fund moonshots, but there's different aspects and there's different forms as well um, of support from the government, right? So you have grants that are things for really research and development and some of the fundamentals, and you have some grants that are really, okay, well, we're going to really scale this up. And obviously we're not ready for those ones. And so how many as well companies are there that they can really give, you know, the grants? But I think not just that, and one of the things that's really important is not just companies, but also academia, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, a, pretty much everyone where we hire, um, their background was in biotech, not in cultivated meat. And so having people that have already, you know, done their PhD or their postdocs in the sector, and that is a no brainer that it needs to come from government. So I think doing a lot more of that, um, is important as well. Yeah, and Israel does that really well. They have that nice triangle between government and universities and independent investors, private equity investors, and of course the scientists. So they've got that nice triangle going and I would like to see something like that. I'm always a little bit, so I, I think the US is very slow. I'm always a little bit confused by Europe who seems to get the sustainability goals and then sometimes be, um, not have not be interested in a level playing field with how their legal system is moving against dairy recently with amendment 171 so um confusing signals but you know it's one step up two steps back and then three steps up and then four steps up and then one step back so it's definitely a pivot game okay as we wrap up today um you know a while ago i want to say it was like a year ago now at kearney said that by 2040 60% of all meat would be a combination of plant-based fermented proteins or cellular agriculture. And so it is no longer uh, the, the alt protein. It's 60%. So these um, alternative proteins are now the majority protein. That, I think, is a year that is way too out in the future now. So I'm wondering if you all could make... Um, uh, just give me a year. We're going to go around the room, starting with Benjamina, then to Patricia. What is the year you think that all of these alternative meats, the three types, will be the majority meat? Benjamina? I, I don't know. I think that's a pretty good prediction, to be honest, that they have. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll push for, for closer, but I think, you know, if you look at the scale of what needs to be done, I think it's also a realistic one. Patricia? Yeah, I would agree with, with Benjamina there. And the other thing is we see that meat demand is increasing, right? And depending on which model you look at, there will be a point where we just cannot scale this anymore to really meet all the demands. And there are certain types of meats that we already cannot meet the demand, for example, bison and wagyu. So I think that might be one of the reasons that really um, also skews this in our direction. But Already now you see plant-based taking up. So I would say if we're faster, like Benjamina said, it's 2030, 2035, uh, but 2040 sounds good to me. Let me calculate in my head where I am then. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, what's your year? Um, I mean, I think that's a tough one. I'm probably going to, just to be on the safe side, I'll probably agree with the, <laughs> with the, with the other guys. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's also like um, a question, right? Like 
Um, sorry, now I kind of lost my train of thought here, but uh, yeah, I think I think like them too, and, and like I think when it comes to food, yeah, like it's very, it's still very much like a cultural thing, and like you know we grow up eating something, so I think it's also going to be a question of that. Like I, I have a hard time imagining my grandmother, my sweet grandmother in Denmark, like you know all of a sudden switching up and you know buying something else that she's used to. So I think it's also a question of that, right? Like eating habits, it is hard to change, right? Like, any habit is, and I think like diet and stuff like that, it's so cultural. So I think that that's also what's going to take that time, right? Uh, like even you know beyond just like the scaling right we need to make that switch and just give you like the, the new future and how we're going to eating um i'm gonna re restate the question just so nervous it's kind of top of mind what's the year you think that the three uh, meets will be the majority player i'm gonna be the most optimistic here and also <laughs> uh, uh 2030 uh i'm pretty sure and the reason for my um, estimation is because at AT Kearney did that study in 2019 and yes. which was pre-COVID, pre the California fires, uh, pre all these climate change, uh, you know, uh, disasters that are coming our way. They're going to be more and more uh, another pandemic, etc. There are so many things happening that I think uh, climate change is going to play a major role in the in the in global in decisions. And that's why it's going to be a accelerator. Yeah. And the money pouring in is going to really push everything forward. One word answer, starting with Nieves going around the, the, the room here. What is your favorite snack? Chips. All my friends know. Chips. It. Okay. What kind of chip? Potato chip? Nacho chip? Like uh, a salt. Chip? Kettle cooked salt. Plain. Oh, yeah. I feel <laughs> you. All right. Stephanie? Um, I think mine's gonna be a beverage. I love soda. <laughs> That's probably my really? my <laughs> yeah. I, I can't even remember anything any day. <laughs> I can't even remember the last time I had soda. That is so I love amazing. It. It's so refreshing. <laughs> That's so funny. Patricia. Is Miss Call a snack? No, just kidding. Um <laughs> <laughs> it can be apples. Absolutely yeah. apples. People even make fun of me because I'm from Austria and I always have an apple and people are like, you eat a lot of apples, but then I can share them with my horse. So it's awesome. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. Apples and mezcal. Okay. Benjamin, you've got the last word. What's your favorite snack? Oh, it's so hard because <laughs> I love snacking. Um, I'll say a recent interesting one that I've discovered um, is frozen grapes. Frozen it's grapes? really good. Yeah. Oh, very, very good. So I don't, I don't think it's my favorite, but it's great. It's a, so you, yeah. it's sort of like a hard candy. You just suck on it for a little while. Yeah, okay. yeah and so frozen mango, frozen grapes, all <laughs> all as a great snack because it's like ice cream, but it's not. That's it's wonderful. Here. Okay, I'm adding it to the list. <laughs> frozen grapes, it's so great. Oh, I want dates to thank as well. you. Dates. <laughs> okay. Dates. I love dates. I take a salted cashew and I stick it in the date. And then I have like the fat and the salt and the sweet together. And then I go hiking. Yes, it's good. Okay, it's yeah. a good <laughs> equation. I want to thank everybody for being here and for literally your fingerprints. 20 years from now, we're going to say, oh my God, did people eat animals? How crazy. And you are going to say to your kids, I had a hand in making that possible. I am so deeply grateful for the change that you are making. I am watching your moves every week. I'm cheering you on from the sidelines. Nieves Martinez Marshall at Novel Food, Novel Farms. Thank you for being here. Stephanie yeah. Michelson of um, Gelatech. Thank you for being here. Benjamina Bolag. I know it's late in London. Thank you for being here of higher stakes. And Patricia Bubner, congratulations to you again on your big fat raise. Thank you so uh, or much. Billion. Thank you for being here. All of you guys don't go away. Everybody else who's live with me on social media. I will see you next week and don't forget to subscribe. You guys stay put.